and uh, we started about two months ago in Luke chapter 1, and uh, so we've been taking our good time, uh, and Jeff gave me 22 verses to go over with you guys this morning, which I was like, oh yeah, it's not bad, and I looked at him, and I said, oh my gosh, there's so much good stuff in here, like, I, I, there's like three or four sermons in this message, Does that makes sense, it's just there's so much, and then I'm thinking, well, Jeff, you know, Jeff preached four verses on the first chapter, <laughs> and for the first week, I was like, I don't want four, but man, 22, this is a lot. And so I just want to prepare you. We're gonna, you're going to hear like three little mini sermons, but we're going to land on this guy, John. Uh, so this, um, this week, we are talking about the ministry of John. And before we do that, um, we do one thing at Inroads. You guys, if you're not comfortable with this, you don't have to, but we just, this is where we feel like God is speaking to us. And so we do this if you feel comfortable with me. Lift your Bible and say, Inroads, do we believe that this is the inspired word of God? And so say, Amen. Amen. All right, let's get started. Um, before we hop in, I, I kind of like, I'm going to go ahead and jump to the conclusion here, okay? And it's this, is we're talking about the ministry of John today. And as we're singing that song, Lord of Lords, the verse, the first verse just sums up John so much. It says this, beholding your beauty is all that I long for. To worship you, Jesus, is my sole desire. For this very heart, for this very heart, you have shaped for your pleasure, purpose to lift your name higher. I just feel like that is the song of John the Baptist. Like John was born as Jesus' cousin a few months before him, and his whole purpose was just to point to Jesus with his entire life. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. So if you guys are ready, say yeah. All right, here we go. Luke chapter 3, verse 1, it says this. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor over Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip tetrarch of um, the region of Iteria, and uh, Trachonitis and Lysanias, all the historians are like, oh my gosh, uh, Tetrarch of Abilene. During the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. Okay, big intro, right? Uh, and it's all these historical names. But here's what you have to understand. The book of Luke was written for the Greeks. They didn't really care about Hebrew lineage. They cared more about, okay, who were the politicians at the time? Who is in charge, right? That's who this this that's who the crowd is for. Okay, so it's like in the days of Barack Obama and so and so and so and so, right? But this is back then. Caesar, Pontius Pilate, and then there's the, all these guys, An, uh, Annas and Caiaphas, right? And what's interesting is all I really want to say on this is I think it's interesting that for us as we continue in the series of Luke, um, the stage is being set. The stage is being set. The the the, the chess pieces are being moved into place. The characters are in place, right? And, and these guys, you often know them from later on when Jesus is being hung on the cross. That's when we start to hear the name Pilate or Caiaphas, right? But what we have to understand is that these guys were around for three years watching this guy Jesus just run around town with this crowd like, whoa, just what the heck? You know, trying to get their hands on it. And, 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 and it's guys like Caiaphas and Annas. That that's who Jesus is talking to in the crowd with the Pharisees, right? So, but I want to show you how important that is. Because not necessarily for this sermon, but as we go forward in sermons, you have to understand who the crowd is and who is listening to Jesus as Jeff continues us in this book. So look at where these guys pop up later. In John 18, Jesus faces uh, Annas and Caiaphas. And it says this, so the band of soldiers and their captain and officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. So Jesus is in the peak of his ministry and Jesus knows he's about to be arrested, and um, Annas and Caiaphas send a band of soldiers in the middle of the night to arrest Jesus. It says, first they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. So here's what you've got to understand about Annas and Caiaphas. They're, kind, they're, 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 they're the high priests, but they, they kind of have like a political agenda to them. Does that make sense? And they're like, it would be expedient for us to get rid of this guy, Jesus, because he is causing a muck. He is teaching a new teaching. He's causing a revolution. And, and honestly, they're getting in our way of being high priests. So they're kind of like, uh, we want to get rid of Jesus. They send a band of soldiers in the middle of the night. Later in John 18, it says this. The high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and teaching. So they're questioning Jesus. And Jesus answered, uh, if I have spoken openly to the world, or he says, I, sorry, he says, I have spoken openly to the world. I've always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I've said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? 
ask those who have heard me what I said and, and uh, that I've said to them. They know what I've said. So uh, what I love about this part is, is Jesus says, hey, I've never said anything in secret, y'all. I don't know why you got to bring here in the middle of the night and ask me, which is kind of funny because they brought him in secret, right? And so he's kind of like, uh, I haven't done anything in secret. And he doesn't say it directly. He's like, but you guys, you know what I mean? He's like kind of calling them out because it's like, why, why are we having this meeting in the middle of the night? Why is not everyone able to be here? Why am I arrested in the middle of the night? Because, because you have nothing on me. You're wrongly accusing me, right? Verse 22, it says, when he had said these things, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand saying, is that how you answer the high priest? And Jesus answered him, what if, I, uh, if what I said is wrong, bear witness about, what, uh, about the wrong. But if what I said is right, why do you strike me? Annas, basically having nothing, then sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest, right? So these two high priests are like, oh, like we just we can't find anything on him, right? And so they finally send him to Pilate. And Matthew 27 says this, Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted, and they had then a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus, who's called Christ? So Pilate is kind of like the guy that looked over the Jewish people on behalf of the Romans at the time, right? And Barabbas is kind of like the governor at the time. And he's already had a couple of riots, and he's like hoping that Caesar isn't going to get mad at him again. And, and this crowd comes up with Jesus. And it's during this time where he can release a prisoner during this feast. And he says, do you guys want Barabbas? Like hoping they'll take Barabbas, or do you want Jesus? And it says, um, uh, verse 18, for he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. Besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, have nothing to do with that righteous man, Jesus, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. So Pilate knows that, that Jesus has really done nothing wrong, and, and he knows that just out of the envy of this crowd, out of Caiaphas and Annas, and he's just like, uh, do you want me to get rid of, Bar- like, release Barabbas or Jesus? And it says, now the chief priests and elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to destroy Jesus. The governor again said to them, which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, then what shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? They all said, let him be crucified. And he said, why, what evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather a riot was beginning, he took water, washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I'm innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, his blood be uh, on us and our children. Then he released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. Wow. Right? Pilate is just kind of like, hey, I don't want to riot. He washes his hand, and he's like, you guys do what you got to do. And he has him crucified. I, I, I just bring this up because we have to understand, looking back at um, um, Luke 3 here, is that the, the, the players are coming into place, right? The stage is being set. Um, powers are going into place where later on this is going to really escalate and boil. But one thing that I want to just draw our attention to is kind of like a little mini lesson is if you look at this, it says that it released, they released Barabbas, right? And, and Jeff talked last week about Jesus being a, a child, teaching and listening and teaching, exchanging in the temple. And I love what Jeff said last week. He said that, 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 that this was fully God, that Jesus was fully God and fully man at the same time. Which is great because uh, when I was at the college weekend, ironically, we, we talked about the exact same thing. There's this great sculptish pastor, Alistair Begg, right? I don't know if you guys ever listen to Alistair Begg. He's great. But Alistair Begg, the way he says it is it's kind of like a circle and a square. Like how do you have a circle and a square together at the same time? It kind of blows your mind, right? Like how do we have fully man and fully God at the same time, right? But I want to say this. Jesus was fully man and fully God, Right? backing up what Jeff was teaching last week. Because if he wasn't, then the only person that got freedom from this whole crucifixion was Barabbas. If, he was just, if Jesus was just a man, then Barabbas was the only one that got set free. But because Jesus is man and God, he died on the cross for all of our sins. He says, Father, forgive them. And he, and he frees all of us. It was a divine sacrifice, a godly sacrifice that not only gave uh, opportunity of freedom from sin from Barabbas, but to all of us as well. Amen? Pretty rad. All right, moving on back to Luke 3. So, in that, we have all these puzzle pieces coming together. We have, you know, uh, Annas, Caiaphas, Pilate, 
who, who see Jesus as a delinquent. They see him as stirring up trouble. Oh, you're going to cause a riot in my town. You're taking away my political power. You're messing things up. But on team Jesus is my favorite dude, John the Baptist, right? It says, verse 2, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. Bravo, John the Baptist is on the scene. And what I love about this, we're, we're fast forward. Last week, we're talking about Jesus kind of like a, you know, 12 years old. Here we are. He's starting his ministry. John the Baptist is preparing the way for him. And John has one of the coolest jobs. His job is basically just kind of like MC, like, y'all welcome up Jesus, right? And you're like, ah! Here comes Jesus, right? That is John's whole life, his whole ministry is just to point to Jesus. Think about that. His very existence is just to point to Jesus. So much so that he has no time, apparently, for bathing himself or dressing fine or even a good meal. Uh, Look at Matthew 3, 4. It says, now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. What? Are you kidding me? Like, are you serious, John? Right? I just picture him like standing in the river, baptizing people, like, oh, Jesus, you know, baptize Jesus. And they're like, John, eat something, locust. Oh, let's keep going, Jesus, right? He's like, no time for food. We got to talk about Jesus, right? It's incredible. The guy is just pouring out his heart, soul, mind, and strength, everything he has into Jesus, right? And, and um, I, I, you know, that's kind of where we're going to land later on today. It's like, how do we do that with our lives? Right? How do we just put all of our chips fully into Jesus, right? And in a modern day example is I love this guy. I love art. This guy, Leonard Knight. I don't know if you guys ever seen every time you ever seen Leonard Knight. No? A few of you? This is in Southern California. Leonard Knight is an interesting guy. He painted that mountain behind him. And Leonard Knight was in the Korean War and kind of an interesting guy. Didn't meet Jesus until he was about thirty five. And he was just sitting in his car one day in the driveway, and he just prayed the sinner's prayer. And he prayed, Jesus, I'm a sinner. Please come upon my body and into my heart. That was his prayer. Leonard reminds me of kind of like a modern-day John the Baptist. This guy just recently passed away. Uh, but what's interesting about his, his life is that after he accepted Christ, he was pretty poor, but he wanted people to know the same prayer that he knew. And his main saying was always, love Jesus and keep it simple. Amen? Love Jesus and keep it simple. For the first 14 years of his life, this guy tried to build an air balloon by hand with stitching on it that said, Jesus, I'm a sinner. Please come on upon my body and into my heart. Like, he wanted people to know that sinner's prayer. And he was like, how can I advertise that to the world? How can I point people towards Jesus? And he thought, I know. I'll get in the sky. I'll build an air balloon. I'll fly all around the country. and People will know of Jesus, right? So he built this hot air balloon, or at least he tried built the engine by hand. He would sew together the hot air balloon every night. But what happens over the course of 14 years with cloth is that right when he's done, he's ready to inflate it, like a stitching would rot or come undone. And he could just never get enough stitching or enough parts to bring it all together. And after 14 years, he finally gave up on it. He said, this is just not going to happen. So he traveled around the country a little bit, and all of a sudden he landed in Southern California, and he found some land that was you know, government-owned and just kind of squatted on the land. He's like, all right, I'm just going to stay here and figure out how to tell people about Jesus. And he saw this mound of dirt and garbage, and he's like, I know. I'm going to paint a mountain with Jesus on it. And so he, he, he calls it Salvation Mountain. It's in, it's in um, Imperial County, California. He would go to the local garbage dump, and he, would, he, says, he said, I would spend all day looking for half a can of paint, which only half of it was good to paint with. And then he'd take that can of paint, and he started, you see the heart in the middle? He started off with that heart, which has that sinner's prayer in that. And then he just kept on adding to the mountain more and more all this imagery of Jesus, right? He's been doing this for 35 years. If you see him, he's at the mountain, and he, when he was alive, he just had paint all of him all the time, just sunburnt and scorched and just painting nonstop, right? It's interesting, the mountain, after several years, the original mountain actually fell apart and decayed. It kind of caved in because there's just a mountain of dirt with paint holding it together. And he actually gave thanks to God. He says, you have shown me that needs to be of better structural integrity so it will last through the ages. And so he rebuilt the mountain using clay and Native American tactics with, like, hay and all that stuff. And then now it's a solid mound of paint proclaiming Jesus. California tried to shut it down at one point. They said, oh, the toxins are getting into the dirt. And they did the test, and they proved it wasn't true. And it has recently been um, identified as a historic landmark uh, for folk art in the country. So (laughs) this guy, with this simple little skill of painting he says love jesus keep it simple 
And he spends his whole life trying to share people Jesus through his love of free people. Like, for some reason, this guy just reminds me of John the Baptist. He's like, you know, I don't, I don't care about what I'm wearing. He, he, he lived in his car, and he just went all out digging through garbage dumps just to find paint so that he could paint the image of Christ to people. It really reminds me a lot of John. John continues on in verse 3. He says, and he went into all the region around Jordan, proclaiming the baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of the one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Talk about John. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall become straight, and the rough places will, shall become level ways, and all flesh shall see, shall see the salvation of God. What John is preaching here is a whole new theology that there was this high mountain of folk that were God's chosen people that will now be made level with all nations. John was basically saying that once Jesus comes, everyone will have full access to the Father. No matter what your social class is, your age, your, your, your ethnicity, no matter what your gender is, he's like, God will be available for all. And he says this, he says, he said, therefore, to the crowds that came out to be baptized him, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Now, that's a crazy statement, right? You call people, hey, I'm coming out to be baptized, you brood of vipers. Oh, right? <laughs> it's kind of like, what? What he's, what he's talking here is he's more so talking to the Pharisees that are kind of watching on the hillside, like, what's going on? You know what I mean? And, and he says, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. What, what a great verse. If you need a verse to put on your dashboard or your mirror, take this one right here. Bear fruits in keeping with repentance. What that means is check your heart, repent of your sin, and then bear fruit in the name of your loving Savior. Right? Bear fruit, what does that mean? That means doing things that honor the Lord and seeing the fruit of his kingdom in your life. Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And, and then this part, though, he, this is where you realize he is speaking to the Pharisees. He says, do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. He's basically saying, hey, you guys that have been like in this lineage of priesthood, you just think, oh, we're just on, we're on team God. Like, we, you know, we've been the Jewish nation forever, and, and we know God's on our side because God was with our forefather. And because I'm his, I, you know, I'm his great, 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 great grandson, God's with me too. And, he, and, and John challenges him. He says, uh, don't just ride on the fact that you have the family name. Because the truth is, he says, if God wants to, he could just make more children out of Abraham out of the stones. Right? And they're just like, what? He's like, take away all their validity. He's like, it, it doesn't matter that you're just born in this nation. What matters is your heart. And that's where he says, bear fruits in keeping with repentance. And, and this, is, this is huge going forth because this is the first time in 400 years of silence that all of a sudden there's a new theology. There's a new ministry. He's paving the way for Jesus. And it started to take those characters like uh, Annas and Caiaphas and starting to really turn up and flip the world upside down. And they're not happy about it, right? It says this, verse 9, Even now the axe is laid at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And so the crowds ask them, this is what I love now, the crowds, like, they're hearing this new theology, right? They haven't heard anything new in 400 years. And all of a sudden, they're like, wait, 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 what? Like, they're, they're asking, like, how do we do that? How do we bear fruit while, while keeping of repentance? How do we do that? And so it says, and the crowds ask them, what then shall we do? And he answered them, uh, whoever has two tunics, which is like a jacket, whoever has two tunics, share with him who has none. And whoever has food is to do likewise. Tax collectors also came to be baptized, and they said to him, teacher, what, what shall we do? And he said to them, collect no more than you are authorized to do. And soldiers also asked him, and we, what should we do? And he said to them, do not extort money from anyone by threats or by false accusation, and be content with your wages. They're, they're kind of like, hey, wait, what do we do under this new teaching? He's like, uh, have faith and do it. Execute your faith. Live it out. Live out bearing fruit and keeping with forgiveness. He's like, your family title no longer just like, gives you this free pass, it's like you have to change, it's your heart, right? And I love that in John chapter 1, verse 12 through 13, it says this, says, but to all who did receive Jesus, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood or the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but born of God. 
Like John chapter 1, verse 12, 13, it's just basically saying, hey, it's no longer, it's, it's not this thought of just like, oh, I was born to Abraham. No, it says, to all who receive him, to those who believe in his name, you are there born of God. Do we believe in the name of Jesus? And that's what John is challenging them with. And as the people, as the people are in expectation, and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Christ, John answered to them all saying, uh, I baptize you with water. But he who is mightier than I is coming, the strap of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn. But the, ch- uh, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. And so what I love about this part is that they're starting to question their hearts. Wait, wait, wait. Do we really know our Christ? Do we really know salvation? And he said, and they're sort of like, wait, is John? Is he the salvation? Is he the guy? And he says, no, 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 no. And look at his humility. He says, I only baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming, who I cannot even be worthy to untie his sandal. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Again, what is, Je- what is John doing? He's pointing. He's like, Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. With so... Uh, So with many other exhortations, he preached good news to the people. But Herod the Tetrarch, who had been reproved by him for Herodias, his brother's wife, and for all the evil things that Herod had done, added this to them all, and he locked up John in prison. So here's what happens. John goes out in his little camel fur, (laughs) eating locusts, day in, day out, saying, Jesus is coming, like, Jesus, Jesus, right? And he's, he's like, Telling people, get ready. I'm not the Messiah. I'm not the end all. Jesus is coming. Glory to Jesus. And then even in the midst of that, he also takes time out, and he's going to Herod, who is a a political leader at the time, and he's saying, hey, I I see what you're doing. You're trying to steal your brother's wife, and that's not biblical. And he's calling out Herod. Herod doesn't like it. Throws him in jail. And Herod would almost want to kill John because he's getting in the way of his sin, but he doesn't because he realizes that a lot of people acknowledge John as a prophet. And if he does, he's going to have a really bad riot on his hands. So the most he could do is lock him up to shut him up. And so check this out. This is what happens. Uh, Matthew 11. When Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in their cities. Now when John heard in prison about the deeds of, of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples. So John has been in prison now for a while. And he hears that Jesus is going around doing teaching, preaching miracles, which John is all about, right? So he's in prison hearing this. He's like, yes, Jesus is on the move, right? And he has his own disciples. And so he tells his disciples, go find Jesus. And it says, and he said to them, um, uh, I'm sorry, the the disciples asked Jesus. They say, are you the one who is to come who shall, uh, or shall we look for other, uh, for another? They basically go up to him like, hey, John sent us. Are you the Christ? And Jesus replies to them, he says, go and tell John that you hear and see, the blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them, and blessed is the one who is not offended by me. I love that last sentence, blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Guys, if we're offended by Jesus, then we need to check our hearts, right? If Jesus is saying something that's really offending us, Guess what? He's the Lord of Lords. He's the only one. So we got to check our hearts. Amen? I love this, that John sends his guys to Jesus. And the guys come up to Jesus and say, hey, are, are you the one? Or should we go find someone else? And he goes, no, no, no. Tell John that his students are in good hands. Tell them that you will uh, see me heal. Tell, tell him that the blind receive their sight and the lame are walking. Tell them that lepers are cleansed and the deaf can hear and the dead are raised up. Tell them that the poor have good news and have been preached to them. He's basically saying, hey, tell John that you didn't just fall into the right hands, you fell into the hands. Right? And, and, and for John, this is huge. He's, I could imagine him in jail being like, I'm here, but it doesn't matter because all my disciples are now disciples of Jesus. Again, John pointing, Jesus is all about him. And, and that's important for us because we have to ask ourselves, what are we doing with our disciples, right? 
even if you're not like a church pastor, staff, or something, like, you, you still have disciples in your life. You have children. You have, maybe you have kids that you mentor, or maybe you have friends. Are, are you just lateraling them over to Jesus? What are we doing with our disciples? And I love John's heart because he's like, I'm in jail. I, I've never had a decent job. I've been eating bugs for years. But it doesn't matter because my friends are now walking with Jesus. And, and it doesn't get any better for John. I wish it did. But check this out, Matthew 14. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard about the fame of Jesus, and he said to his servants, this is John the Baptist. He's been raised uh, from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers at work in him. For Herod had seized John and bound him and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. Because John had been saying to him, it is not lawful for you to have her. So Herod, you know, has John in prison because, because uh, John doesn't approve of Herod's marriage. And though he wanted to put him to death, Herod feared the people because they held him to be a prophet. So look at what happened to John. But when Herod's birthday came, the daughter of Herodias, the gal that he's having the affair with, danced before the company and pleased Herod so that Herod promised with an oath to give her whatever she might ask, prompted by her mother. Oh, this little gal, prompted by her mother, she said, give me the head of John the Baptist here on a platter. And the king was sorry, but because of his oaths and his guests, he commanded it to be given. He sent had John beheaded in the prison, and his head was brought on a platter and given to the girl, and she, was, and she brought it to her mother. And his disciples came and took the body and buried it, and they went and told Jesus. Wow, what an ending. Your whole life you point to Christ. And, and your grand finale is that a 12-year-old girl gets you beheaded and your head's on a platter at a birthday party. Tremendous. But, but John, who is now with the Father in heaven, I'm, he's like, glory to God. It's all for Jesus. It was all for Jesus. And this is where I want to camp. This is where I want us to understand. Is in our lives, are we comfortable with being in second place? Are we comfortable with our lives to be in second place? Are we, are we comfortable with like, you know what? I, I might not have the best clothes in Jesus' name. I might be persecuted in Jesus' name. I might be the laughing stock of a birthday party in Jesus' name. Right? John just did everything to point people to Jesus. Um, it reminds me of uh, this one time I was working at a Young Life camp, and I, I brought this kid uh, when I was doing urban ministry, really rough kid. Uh, I just met him like two days before this trip, and I was young and energetic, so I decided to take him to camp, right? And I take this kid, he's a short guy like this, and he just had so much anger. And we're at camp. He got in a couple fights at camp. And... Um, you know, I, I'll be honest, I kind of clocked out on a little bit. My, my area director was like, what do you want to do with him? I was like, I think we should send him home. He's being a disruption. And the area director was like, no, I, I think it's going to be good for this kid to stay. He needs to hear about Jesus. And uh, <laughs> so this kid rolled his ankle, like, on the third day of camp, which I was actually kind of thankful for because he was trying to fight people. Like, hey, come here. <laughs> you know? And he couldn't get any more fights. <laughs> so, so he kind of calmed down, okay? <laughs> so, um, but the camp speaker um, wa was watching us, there was a ride there at the camp where you could take kids parasailing. And they had this awesome parasailing boat where all you do is get on this boat and have this, this pole on it and they'd strap you in and you just sit on the back of the boat and the boat starts going and then all of a sudden your parasail goes like that and you're like, yay! And then you come back down. Like you literally have to do nothing. You just, you just sit in this harness and the boat driver is like, yay! You come back down, right? That's all you have to do. But that boat broke down. So, and all the kids are like, we still want to go parasailing! So they're like, oh, okay, well, I guess we can do this the old school way. We can do the running beach start. And I was like, oh, my goodness. You see where this is going, right? So we go. It's our turn to do the running beach start. All my healthy athletic kids team up, and no one's teaming up with this kid, Brandon. They're like, I ain't going with that guy. He's got a rolled ankle. We're going to get dragged through the sand, right? And so, and, and the, the, honestly, the kid's just having this awful attitude. He's like, I want to do this stupid, you know? And I'm just like, oh, my gosh. And, um, and the camp speaker walks by, and he says, hey, are you going parasailing? The kid's like, no, I got my rolled ankle. Rolled ankle. He's like, no, we're going to get you parasailing. We're going to do that today. You're, you're going parasailing. He's like, I can't have a rolled ankle. He's like, I'll carry you. I'll run with you. Right? <laughs> and then he, like, grabs this poor 
summer staff kid who's just there working. He's like, hey, you're helping me out. We're going to run and carry this kid. And, and they're like, who's going with him? We need to balance out the parasail. Like, your leader's going to go with him. I'm like, oh, great. <laughs> so I'm just picturing, I'm, so I'm strapped in, right? This kid's here, rolled ankle, just awful look on his face. Like, this is so stupid. Camp speaker's wedged between us, college guy on the other side, and the boat starts going. You know what I mean? And it's like 100 feet from us and sand to drowning. And, you know? and so they just start going. And you feel the thing start taking you. Like, oh! You know, so you start running. These guys are running and carrying. Like, you know what I mean? And we're not getting fast enough. You got to go fast because all right, you're just going to get dragged, right? The last second, as they start getting in the water, they like throw us, and both of them just face plant into like an inch of sand and water. And we go like, da, 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 right? <laughs> and we just take off, and everyone on the beach is like, yeah, you know. And I see, I look over the kid's face, and he's just like, <laughs> and he just this big smile came, right? And that was just awesome to me. That was, we are pointing to Jesus. Amen? We're going to do everything possible to point you to the goodness of God. So much, I'm going to face plant myself in the sand. Because you need to know Jesus. And that's John. John is just like, you, you want me to be the laughing stock of your birthday party? Great. I don't care. Know Jesus. I don't have a job. I don't care. I'm teaching about Jesus. I'm hungry. Locust. Jesus. He's just like, I will not stop. Right? And, and you, know, you know, it's easy to say, okay, well, back then, it's biblical times. Everyone was, like, doing biblical things. Uh, no. There was 400 years of silence. And, Jesus, and John comes in and starts turning it up. Right? And here's what we got to understand. I think it's harder for us because, well, maybe it's not hard. I don't know. But. You know, we're so used to America in the good old days. It's like Christian culture and American culture were the same culture. And now it's splitting where it's like, this is Christian culture, this is American culture. And we live in that gap and we struggle with that. Because we're like, oh, I got to like think differently than my neighbor. Okay. But, but if I'm the laughing stock of the party, I still want to say that's Christ. This is the timeless God who loved me and died for me on the cross. You can put my head on a platter, but that's who Jesus is. In Luke last chapter, last verse here, says, now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also uh, had been baptized and was praying, the heavens were open. John baptized Jesus, and the heavens were open, and the Holy Spirit descended on him like in, in bodily form, like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son, with you I'm well pleased. I love this, because John the Baptist is watching this voice from heaven come down, and it's not going on to him. It's going on to Jesus. It says, you are my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. And I love that John was probably just as excited as Jesus. You know what I mean? Just He's just like, yes, that's what I've been talking about, guys. You see it? Caiaphas and Anna standing on the hilltop like, dang it, you know? And he's like, this is what I've been talking about. This is God in a body here for us. And, and, and it gave him nothing more pleasure than to just be there just to baptize Christ and then God say, this is my son who I'm well pleased. And that's where I want to end up. Is, is, is how, do we, how do we live that in our lives? How do we just point people continuously to Christ? How do we learn from John to say, you know what, at the end of the day, it's not about me. You know, I might be the laughing stock of the party I might not have the most comfortable life, but it's not about me. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Amen? Let's pray. God, thank you uh, for your word. Thank you for your teaching. Thank you, Christ, that you came down to hang out with us for 33 years to then die a sinner's death for us, that we may be lifted up with you in the last days. Thanks, Lord, for the ministry of John. I hope to meet him one day. Just thank you, Lord, for his example of life and pray that we would have the same strength and courage to continuously point to you, to our friends, to our disciples, even when it's at our cost. And all God's people said, amen.